J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and today on my show, I'm talking to Sharon Lynn from Flagstaff in Arizona in the United States. She's joining me to talk about her A Cotswold Crimes mystery series, to which there are two books presently written. Whether she writes another one, well, we'll find out later on, everybody. And the books are, the first one was Death Takes a Bath, and her latest book, which has just been released, Death Takes a Fall. The books are set in the Cotswolds, an area of outstanding beauty in England. Hence the title of the series, everyone. Why does she set the plot there? Well, we'll ask her very shortly why she set the storylines there and the characters there. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Sharon lives in a stunning part of the United States, as I said, Flagstaff from Arizona. Now we're all familiar with the Grand Canyon. And for those of us who have been fortunate to experience the canyon can understand the natural beauty of that area. An area Sharon Lynn is privileged to live in. But I also learned today that she splits her time between Flagstaff because she has a boat, everybody. And she goes there to San Diego where the boat is and sits on the boat there along the ocean tides there and creating more of her imaginary mystery crime series. Sharon is a professor of theatre, film and writing. Her husband and her dog Ozzy, along with all the other passions of her life, her travelling, her cooking, her mentoring, young writers and filmmakers, keep her very, very, very busy, everybody. So let's get her on the show to chat about herself and her books, which are when you look at them every day, they are brilliantly written and the storylines are so fascinating. I can't say fairer than that. So I need to shut up now, everybody, and get Sharon on the show so she can tell you all about her books. Sharon, come and join me. I get a bit bored being on my own here. Come and join me. Thank you so much, John. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, the, the, the total pleasure is mine, because when I looked at your books, I thought, I need to get this lady on my show to talk about these books. And she agreed, everyone. Yay! <laughs> now, Sharon, before we dive into the books, would you care to tell the audience a little about yourself and your books? Basically, who are you and what are your books about? Who is Sharon Lynn and these crime novels? Okay, so who am I? I, as you said, I'm I'm a college professor or a university professor. I teach writing. I teach um, film studies and theater, uh, which the theater helps a lot when when you're teaching to keep keep the students entertained. I started writing because I kind of had to. I just had this story, and I started out writing a romance. And my problem with writing a romance is that I kept throwing dead bodies at my heroine. So I kind of (laughs) tried to turn that first novel into a mystery. And I just sort of, I learned a lot. I'll say that. I learned a lot writing that first one. And that first one is, the main character is the mother of the main character in a Cotswold Crimes mystery series. So um, Heather, who is a Shakespeare professor. And when I when I kind of just put that one down and set it aside, it was like, okay, I learned a lot, but I cannot do anything with this. I wanted to write something about the daughter. I just really enjoyed the daughter character. I have a daughter who's that age. I work with students who are that age all the time. And when you're a female and you're 19, that's one of the times when your brain remaps. So it remaps several times as you're growing up when you're two, when you're 10. The movie Inside Out, that is absolutely what your brain does. And it happens when you're 19. And the thing with 19 year old females is they are simultaneously the smartest and the most insane creatures on earth. So they're fun to write about. 
And as I said, my, my, my daughter was about that age, a little older when I started writing. So I had a lot to draw from. And I picked the city of Bath because I was lucky enough to have lived there when I was a teenager. And so it really does kind of feel like home to me whenever, whenever I go, especially as the city, um, I mean, you know, it's like the Huntsman uh, pub, you know, it was there when I was a teenager. It was there when I went back, you know, 10 years later. It was there when my husband and I visited. There's just something so comforting in how many things just kind of like stay the same with a few little other things that that kind of pop in and, and make it exciting. And so I absolutely love the area. Uh, my husband and I did a, and my daughter actually, um, did a walk on the Cotswold Way. And let me tell you, it is much steeper than I thought it was going to be. Um, and we were not properly prepared. So, uh, and and that's kind of what, 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 uh, what we start out with in book two, in Death Takes a Fall. I know, don't go there. <laughs> don't, I, I know, we're not there yet. Not yet. <laughs> Wait, you turn. <laughs> of course, Bath, everybody in the United Kingdom is quite a posh place, everyone. Just let me know that. Now, Sharon, let's open the first book uh, in the series, Death Takes a Bath. And of course, in this country, the United Kingdom, it depends on whether you're from the north or the south, whether you say Bath or Bath. Hmm. We northerners say Bath. The southerners say Bath. Just a little bit of irrelevant information there. Now, you tell us this tantalizing story over 40 chapters. Now, we're not going to all the chapters, everybody, for two reasons. Firstly, we'd be here all day if we did. And secondly, it's not the concept of the interview to delve into all the aspects of the book. We're here to give you a sneak preview. If you want to know what's going on in all the book, a very simple answer. Go and buy it. Can't say fairer than that. So go to Sharon's webpage, www.sharonlwrites.com. And there you can get the book and Amazon. Now I've done the marketing pitch. <laughs> Sharon, let's um, head to chapters one and two. Here you introduce us quite naturally to the main protagonist, Madeline Maguire, Maddie, you refer to in the book. On, now, she's an exchange student from America to take up an archaeological internship at the Roman Baths in Bath in England. But she comes across an ear, as you do everyone every day. You come across an ear. A human ear recently severed on her doorstep. And we also get to see here another dominant character in the guise of Constable Edward Bailey. He's introduced here. Now, is he an overbearing clod? Well, you need to read the books to find out and make your own mind there. So my question is to you, Sharon, would you care to let us into the scenes in these first two chapters, but more importantly, why the opening storyline? Why the ear? Okay, well, a couple of things. This wasn't originally the opening of the book. I, when I first started writing it, I wanted everybody to experience that that thrill that is landing in England and you fly over a castle, you know, and it's just like the most amazing experience to do that and I wanted to include all of that and then you get there and everything's just a little off from where you expect it to be the signs don't say exit they say way out and you're like what's going on here and then you get in a car or a coach or a bus and it's driving on the wrong side of the street and everything in your body wants to move it over to the correct side of the street <laughs> And I wanted everybody to experience that, plus the jet lag and the confusion. And it, my first 50 pages, I'll, I'll go ahead and admit it, 50 full pages was just a travelogue of landing in England and getting to Bath. And um, 
it was a lovely travelogue, but it was also boring and not the point of the story. The point of the story was the mystery. So I just, I, I, I brutally excised all of that out and started with where the story starts, which is when, when she gets an ear uh, delivered on her doorstep. And uh, the ear is in a little cardboard box and uh, she has a rabbit at this house she's staying in and the rabbit found the cardboard and chewed into it and she thought well hey it's mostly open anyway I should open the open it the rest of the way and that's that's kind of where our story opens <laughs> her trying to figure out how to call 911 which in England is 999 it is it's 999 here and we drive on the right side of the road the left side uh, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> And the number of times, like I've been there, and I've, I, I, we have, we do go back quite often. Um, I almost went over every single time. I mean, it, you would think by now I would learn how to look the proper direction, but it's just so ingrained in in your psyche to look, and it's opposite. And yeah, um, it's 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 a dangerous country to step into, and that's part of what Maddie um, is experiencing is that that she's used to being the the smart one the pretty one the one who gets whatever she wants the you know everything is easy for her and she gets and, and one of the reasons she wanted this internship is because they speak english in england well english in england is very different than southwest american and and she she doesn't she can't read people as well as she's used to and and she doesn't understand things as well as she's used to and so it really turns her into a fish out of water um kind of kind of experience and constable edward bailey constable edward bailey started as just a hunky constable he was just like you know a good looking guy and i was i was writing it and my editor was looking at it she was like He's boring. And I'm like, you're right. He is boring. And so I, I did what I always tell my students to do. And I, I, you know, filled out a backstory and, and character bio for him. And as I was doing that, his backstory just grew and, and morphed and became so fascinating. And it made him a whole lot more interesting. So he didn't he didn't need to be, you know, just good looking. He he needed to be somebody who understood that Maddie was smart, but he was also smart. So they could have a really interesting back and forth. And then also why he is such a firm rule follower, which comes out a bit more in the second book. Ah. So we've got a um a constable, a police constable, a honky guy with brains. There you yeah. go. <laughs> now, Sharon, let's um, move on down the book and have a look at chapters nine and 10 to see what's going on in this section of the book so that we can understand how far the story has developed so far, moved along, so to speak. Now, the chapters are headed up, The Third Discovery and The Dead Man. The Abbey clock tower has chimed one. Maddie receives several emails from her father. You talk about a donation of £20,000. A dead man. There are bodies all over this book, everybody. A character called Simon. Now he's a tricky character. A knight. Bad publicity. Where are you taking us here? Because I thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> this part of the book. That's why I said, can we talk about it? <laughs> I am taking you down a rabbit hole. Um, so it's one of those things where when you're first starting out in, in your first like real job, uh, when, when you're that age, um, between 18 and, and 25, that you realize that adulting is hard. And the thing that Maddie is experiencing is that she really, really, really wants to do well, but she's really bored. Uh, she's never had to just sit at a desk and, and file all day. 
And so she keeps getting distracted and looking at things and, and she finally decides, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just file the heck out of these things and I'm going to do it well. And um, it's still boring. And so <laughs> she finds this, this, this one um, in a stack of donations, she finds an, a note that's on nice paper and it, it just spurs her imagination because it's so much interesting, more interesting than anything else she had looked at. And so she, she, as she reads it, she thinks, okay, this, this might be a, a little treasure hunt or a little map or something to a, a present to somebody. And she wants to make sure that the, the, this man who, this is Sir Henry, who donated this, this $20,000, she wanted to make sure that, she, that he actually got the present. And so she's finished. She leaves a note for her aristocratic um, co-worker who seems very much to dislike her, uh, saying that she's gone to look for him. And instead she goes and tries to figure out what um, this, this little kind of treasure hunt uh, was leading to because it just says, you know, go to the great baths and, and all that. So she goes there and it's actually the king's bath. And um, and yeah, when 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 she looks around, there's only one thing that's amiss, and that is 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 something is floating in that murky green water. <laughs> and so she has to touch it. She's just she's such a naturally curious person. <laughs> Uh, and that's yeah when we find another body another body everybody and that aristocrat is simon just dropping a hint everybody and as i said he's a tricky character my opinion let's spin the wheel again sharon and land on chapters 22 and 23 dinner with simon hmm and the station. You talk about excitement being on a dig, missing Edward, Simon not a romantic substitute, concerns of involvement around a death, again, outright panic, Maddie being taken to a police station for questioning. You're ratcheting up the storyline here, Sean. Would you agree or not? Um, so could you tell the audience what's in this part of the book? Why is Maggie being, why is Maddie being carted off to the cop shop? That's what we say over here, everyone, the cop shop. <laughs> well, um, part of what I wanted to really emphasize in this, in this first novel was how alone she was. She, she, like I said, she kind of comes with all this confidence and then realizes that she has a little bit of a fish out of water. And then her, her friend gets mad at her from back home and won't answer her calls. And, and the constable gets mad at her and won't answer her calls. And, and um, she's just feeling really, really alone. So when Simon offers this little you know, peace offering of, of first off, letting, letting her do some actual archaeology work, which is sifting dirt, uh, and then um, offering to take her to dinner. She's like, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm getting to understand him. Maybe I'm getting to know him a little bit better. Um, but no, he, he, he's, he's there just, he wants her to have one nice day. And then, Unfortunately, he has discovered some things about her that she really wanted to keep secret and um, and some things about her that she just flat out didn't know. And so next she knows she's being uh, carted off to, what did you call it, the cop shop? Cop shop. <laughs> yeah, so, and she doesn't understand why she's there and it's just, there's been a downpour, so she's soaking wet and her shoes are filled with water and, and her jeans are all stiff and cold. And, and then she gets just, you know, plopped into a, a interview room and again, doesn't really understand what's going on or why she's there and tries to assert her, her American 
I deserve my phone call. And, you know, she didn't even know who she would call at that point. So I just, I really wanted her to be as alone as possible at that particular moment and as uncomfortable. So you think the worst possible thing is being thrown in jail? Just add some biological discomfort on top of that and um, and it will be worse. Yeah, Simon's a sneaky toad, everyone. I'm not saying anymore. Um, let's, uh, Sharon, take the audience to a little bit further down the book to chapters 30 and 31. As I says, there are 40 odd chapters, there's 40 chapters in this book. So we're getting towards the quarter of the way, everybody. So we're just giving you a flavor of what's in this book. Now, in these chapters, I found I found them very riveting. That's why I wanted to talk about them. Um, we've got yet another discovery. Here we go again, everyone. And um, potlucks. Hmm, potlucks. Maddie's never considered herself a screaming, squeamish girl. Uh, we've got a, a dark dungeon here. Who wants to hurt her? Cliff Whiteley. Native American water tricks. Potlucks. There's a lot going on here. And I also want to know is, what's Simon up to? What's his game plan? These are very busy, busy chapters. And I think you are setting the reader up to reach the final line. Am I right? You are indeed right. This, this, these two chapters are uh, Maddie's darkest hour, which, which, you know, on every hero's journey, they have that moment where the, the, everything is is wrong and it really doesn't look like there's going to be any way for the hero to survive and that's that's where these these two char chapters are and they are literally dark because she is as you as you mentioned kind of sealed into a room and it's quite dark and she doesn't just doesn't know what to do and as, as she's figuring things out, because what else are you gonna do if you're sealed in the dungeon? You gotta figure something out. Uh, she's she's making more and more discoveries. So, um, you know, they're, they're, she might not be alone and, and some of that not aloneness might include a body um, because it smells really, really bad in there. And she uses her knowledge of Roman architecture to kind of help plan and figure things out. So she she does she does come to that. Uh, the thing about growing up in Arizona, it's very dry here. It's it's dry even up in the mountains. And so the Native Americans did have, have little little tricks to staving off thirst. And so she'd never tried it herself, but she tries it on, 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 on this other thing that she discovers in there, <laughs> person. Well, what can you say, everyone? I think what we better do now, Sharon, is move on to book two. So is that the audience and uh, can find out what you've got installed for them in this book. More bodies, everyone. Now, the second book, Sharon, Death Takes a Fall. Did you enjoy writing, creating the storylines with this book? Did I enjoy it? I loved it, actually. I had such a good time with this. Uh, first off, as I mentioned before, we have we have walked part of the Cotswold Way. Um, and I, again, I, I, from Arizona and the tour company I was using, offered no information. You know, you... I always think of England as these beautiful, soft, rolling hills. <laughs> that's that's, and that's what I was expecting when I booked this walking tour. And at some point, I I realized I'm like, are are, are there going to be places to stop along the way? I was kind of expecting, you know, a little pub or cafe every every uh, um, midway point or something. And and the answer is no, there's not. There's there's just no worse stuff. <laughs> And I also was not expecting it to be nearly as steep as it was. 
And it was so stunning, just absolutely beautiful. But normally I can, I can walk at about, a, I can't do this in, in kilometers, but about three miles to an hour. And so I was, that's what I was expecting on this, on this uh, walk near Painswick. Um, you know, it's like oh, nine miles, it'll be easy. So like five and a half, six hours later, still hadn't gotten to a destination. <laughs> and um, you, you start imagining things. And that's, that's kind of what I did. I did start imagining things. Um, because it's like, it would be so easy just to drop a body there. And, th and this is where my husband gets um, a little concerned is he'll look at something and he'll be like, look at that, that's amazing. I'm like, ooh, and you could hide a body there. It's like, um, okay. <laughs> but you can in the Cotswolds, there are just so many ancient trees and big roots and all kinds of things. But there's also wild hops that grow and blackberries and it it's just it's so just unbelievably beautiful uh and so that's that's where maddie um, and edward start um death takes a fall yeah just walking walking along that trail you see everyone if you go walking with sharon lynn don't walk with her because all she's been looking for is where to put the body no. <laughs> <laughs> walk on your own <laughs> now this book has 43 chapters of twists and turns and all sorts of goings on again let's have a look at some of the chapters and scenes to tempt the audience let's have a look at the first two chapters which you head up the first discovery and old nigel i liked old nigel you start this book off with maddie falling down a cliff here we go everyone hiking with edward mm. On the Cotswolds Way. What a surprise. Old Nigel the horse is involved here. And we have a naked, I'm sorry, I'll start that one again. And we have a dead naked woman. As you do as you walk along the Cotswolds Way. Where are you taking us here with this storyline? And is this the powerful start you intended to kickstart this second book off? Well, yes. Um, un unlike when I wrote Death Takes a Bath, I, um, and I, and I had like 50 pages of just nonsense. With this one, I really did want to start on the Cotswolds way because it's, you know, a Cotswold crimes mystery. And I wanted Maddie's inexperience with the escarpment of, of the Cotswolds. Um, I wanted her inexperience to play into it. And so she sees those, those ripe blackberries and, and reaches for them and just, yeah, slides down the limestone cliff face and, uh, and discovers, and discovers a, a girl about her own age, uh, naked, dead, strange tattoo, and unlike the first book, which started with something on her doorstep, which was very personal, this is this this body is is something that's removed from her. she she wasn't it's not associated with her at all. So all she wants to do with this rather than you know tracking down murderers, which is dangerous, all she wants to do with this situation is make sure that the girl is identified and and remembered. And so that's that's what becomes really important to her. And so that spurs her to try to climb back up uh, off of this ledge, which um, I don't know if they do this in, in England or the UK, but in grade schools in Arizona, every at grade schools, middle schools, high schools, everybody has a climbing wall uh, and you just learn how to climb. Um, I didn't when I was a kid, but but now they do. And so she knows she knows how to how to climb. And so she she gets herself up and and Edward returns with old Nigel. And old Nigel is a draft horse, which is which is a a, a big horse. And uh he she she tells him about the body and he wants to run back to the farm where he got old Nigel to help pull her up up from the cliff uh he wants to run back to that farm and and she's like why wouldn't you ride 
and and he's flummoxed by that. He's like, how would I know how to do that? Uh, everybody uh, kind of in Arizona knows how to ride a horse. It's just, my friends had horses. Um, you, 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 whenever yeah. you go on vacation, you, you book a horse riding trip. I've yeah. been on horseback in Hawaii and in Mexico. And you know, it's just, it's, you just know how to ride a horse. Um, and in addition to that, there's a lot of places that you can take lessons. Uh, and so my daughter took a whole lot of lessons. And so I have Maddie also having taken lessons and is, is actually quite a, quite an adept writer. So she just hops on old Nigel and, and takes him back to the farm. I and, know. Us, and we do have climbing mountains frames here. And I think that old Nigel is an old Shire horse. I think he's an old Shire horse, everybody. But have a look in the book for yourself and make your own ideas. A big old Shire horse. Now, let's explore the contents of chapter six and seven here, Sharon. Rhymes and reasons. And then you flip to monasteries and unicorns. Hmm. Here we have Tori, Tori Gonzalez. In the storyline, he's a longtime friend of Maddie's from school days. Now, my understanding is that Tori is a gay character and they're chatting online. So that's one story that you are talking about here and you're taking the readers to. And then you flip to the next scene to monasteries and unicorns. And I thought, Oh, this is an interesting um, spin on the uh, the books here, from going from one uh, little storyline to something completely different. But yet you link them up. Would you care to comment? Well, I love the character of Tori. Uh, she's sort of an amalgam of of all of my daughter's friends, and she provides a really strong support system for Maddie. And in addition, she has a whole lot of questions about all things religious because, because her abuela, her grandmother, uh, insists that if Tori get a degree in religious studies, her grandmother will pay for her apartment. And so she thinks that's totally worth it. So she's always calling Maddie and saying, okay, you know people at the Bath Abbey which is just a stunning, stunning building, um, stunning place to visit. I love it there. And so uh, Maddie um, will go there and ask questions of, of Father Michael. And so this, this time Tori's asking her to find out um, information about a couple of nursery rhymes and the dissolution of the monasteries um, from Henry VIII. And so she does that, but while she's talking to him, she's like, well, he's a knowledgeable man. He's lived here a long time. So she describes the tattoo that she found on the dead girl and also, uh, which is a unicorn head. And um, so she also gets information about that. And so it's kind of like Tori leads her to the Abbey, uh, but but then she also is using it to find out more about this, this poor girl. Fascinating, isn't it, everybody? I told you there's many twists to this book and there are bodies galore. And so let's have a look at chapters 19 and 20. Let's dig further into the book. Hmm, curious, so I thought. So let's get... Uh, Sharon to tell what's going on in this part of the story, especially when you've got an eye-catching header such as a drop of blood and the first accusation. Maddie seems to think most blokes are, uh, you know, in there are named after historical kings, you know, like William or Charles. You know, she's got the thing that she thinks that, you know, most blokes are named after historical figures. William, James, and of course, Edward. And the characters, Roger and Merrill Priestley. I think, Sharon, your imagination here is so creative. 
And I often thought at times, is she running away with herself here? What are you trying to say to the readers here in these chapters in this part of the book? So um, in this part of the book, uh, Maddie is, she, she's trying to actually not push everybody away, which she kind of did in the first book. She's trying trying to lean a little bit more on, on the people that she knows. And she is renting a room from the Priestleys. Uh, and they're not around much in the first book, which worries her a bit, uh, but they are in the second book. And it's, they're so kind and so wonderful. And actually the Priestleys are based on the, um, and that house, the house that she's in, are based on where I I, I lived when, when we were there when I was a teenager. Um, we just my my dad and and their dad they changed jobs and houses and <laughs> so they were in Southern California <laughs> for a year and we were in England for a year um but of course you know we met them and exchanged uh all, all kinds of communications with them and the and their names actually were Roger and Merrill and they are just lovely lovely people and exactly the kind of people that you would want to stay with if you were traveling abroad. And so um, it, she asks them questions about the tattoos and about finding finding other things that are similar and on, on other people who are still alive. And, and uh, they kind of support the same conclusions that she came to, uh, which is actually not what she wanted. She wanted, she wanted herself to be wrong. Um, so that plants a lot of doubt in her mind about some of the other characters that she would normally use as support. Fascinating, isn't it, everyone? Wait till you get to chapters 30, 31 to see what's in those chapters, because that's where we're going now. We're heading to chapters 30, 31, which you head up the boot and a perfectly acceptable moment of hysteria. Now, there's lots going on in this section of the book, everybody. You know, we've got a flying boot, an angry hedgehog, Brad and Brett scuffling with each other, war work boots, Dolly's determination outweighing her drug called her drug addled brain, the numerous conversations between Maddie and Dolly, Lancelot a horse. We have a saying here in the UK. Spill the beans, Sharon. What are you going on about here in these chapters? Well, one of the things with Death Takes a Fall is, is Maddie is finally feeling comfortable in her internship. She's regained a lot of her confidence. And all of a sudden, there is this um, pretty petite... Uh, other, you know, 19, 20 year old there at the Bobs and everybody is paying attention to her, um, Gwendolyn de Valence, known as Dolly, instead of, of paying attention to Maddie. And so just as she was feeling really, really confident, uh, this other character who is nothing but charming and gracious, but who Maddie is just jealous of and she's not used to being jealous. So, so <laughs> um, she, she just, is suspicious of Dolly all the way through. And uh, there comes a point in these two chapters where they are forced to work together. And um, however, they, they, they've both been, been drugged with different substances, which is bad. And <laughs> it, it muddles it's bad, both, it being drugged, both yeah. of their brains quite a bit. <laughs> mm. So, um, so yeah, with with their kind of drug addled brains, they are trying their hardest to get away, basically. And Maddie finds herself in a hedge and hiding from from very bad men, very, very bad guys. <laughs> and um she hears this this snuffling and this chuffing and this just just and um 
it's a hedgehog, which her first reaction, of course, is that it's so dang cute. And um, we don't have hedgehogs in Arizona. They're actually illegal because uh, um, if if they get out, they would they would like take over and kill natural wildlife. So you can't even have them as a pet in Arizona. So she is just like immediately entranced and then terrified that this silly little thing is going to give away her hiding position. So she's she's trying to get away from this huffing, chuffing, puffing little hedgehog. And um, and, and it is at that moment where, where she realizes it sounds a bit like a pig and it lives in a hedge and hedgehog. And, and that's where her brain is because she's been drugged a bit. And I have hedgehogs in my garden, everybody. And they do exactly the same noise as what Sharon just said, but they are beautiful creatures. Now, I'm just intrigued here, Sharon, out of the two books, do you favour one more than the other, or do you favour them equally? Well, that's an interesting question I hadn't considered before. That's and... why I'm asking it. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> you must do this a lot. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I do actually like them equally because I like where Maddie starts and um, there is a lot in that first book where uh, I, I find especially if, if somebody is a, a father and they read it that they're really annoyed with her at the beginning of the book because she she knows what she should do and she just doesn't do it um, but <laughs> Once, once you stick with her, she 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 figures some stuff out, and I I I really love her resilience in the first book, but in the second book she's growing and she's learning to trust other people more, and um and and I just kind of uh, love that little uh, um, expansion of her character in the second book, and uh so yeah i i love both of them i'm i'm writing the third book now and uh it, it, even more exciting things are happening to her and and to edward and um yeah it's fun i like i like this character i like i like what she's discovering that I was going to ask what's next coming down the line with regards to writing books but you've preempted me there so what can we expect in the third book? Just give us an idea. Apart from more bodies. All right. So yes, the third book, as I said, is being written now. And I did just sign a contract for books four, five, and six. So it will be a good hearty series to dive into. Uh, book three will be out in December of 24. And um, every year after that, for the ones after that, and it's called Death Plays with Fire. And this takes Maddie deeper into the Cotswolds into Chedworth, which is the best preserved Roman villa in England. And um, I, I chatted with the national, national, the curator of national heritage at the uh, National Trust and you know, found out some of the things that uh, student workers do, do at Chedworth. So Maddie, Maddie is just a part of that group who is getting to work to preserve and um, true some of the, the, the radar shots that were taken of the area. And um, Along with that, there are some some strange druid goings on, and Maddie is just really offended at that because the druids were gone by the time Jedworth was was built, and so she's like, "It doesn't make any sense for the druids to do anything to the site. They were gone before it was built, and 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 so um, that that doesn't stop the strange goings ons." Her, her indignation doesn't doesn't do anything to stop. Um, uh, um, it has such an inquisitive a, a nose. And a charred heart. What was that? She has such an inquisitive nose, doesn't she? <laughs> she does, and it it, it probably doesn't suit her well. Um, often she's she's a curious one, but it's it's also one of those traits that you know if if you're in absolutely. 
that yeah. age and going to school and and wanting to become a, a archaeologist where you're you're finding things and having to figure out puzzles it all, th that same trait suits her really well in her what she hopes will be her chosen profession just not so well when you know a charred heart winds up on their door who do you write your books for and who would you like to yeah. see read in your books everyone um okay that's that's a little broad um they are i would say a traditional mystery so in the, in the style of agatha christie there's there's no um on stage violence there's there's it's, it, there, there's no cussing there's 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 no sex um so it it really is a book that any age range could read the heroine is 19 and so I do find a lot of um, kids who are younger than that uh, enjoy reading about, you know, what's going to happen to me when I when I turn that age. Uh, but also, if you have ever been 19 and were confused or out of your depth, which I don't know about you, but I certainly was confused. I certainly, out was. Of my depth. I certainly was, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think it, it it lends itself to a certain nostalgia for um, people of any age to just start thinking about, oh yeah, I remember 19 and, and doing something like that. Yeah, That probably I did, wasn't I idea. didn't like being 19, didn't like it. <laughs> it's tough, tough age. It is. Sharon, where can um, people get your books from? Well, um, everywhere um, in the US, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, local bookstore my my website has links to to these places uh in england it's available at waterstones um and all your social media sites and 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 all my social media sites um and i just also want to say it's it's paperback uh ebook and also audio so however however you like to enjoy your books it's available in all of them uh, my social media, my handle is Sharon L. Writes, kind of on, on everything. Uh, it's also my website, um, SharonLWrites.com. So it's it's kind of easy to find me if you just type in Sharon L. Writes, all is one word. Sharon, Lynn, thank you so much for coming on my show and talking to us today about your two books, your A Cotswold Crime Mystery Books. They are absolutely fascinating, everybody. Bodies galore. A 19-year-old girl. Lots to talk about, lots to chat about. And I simply say, go and have a look and explore who Sharon Lynn is, what she writes about, and read her books. Sharon Lynn, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. Thank you again. I'm JT Crowley. And as I end most of my interviews, thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. Until next time, stay safe.